From the Sumire Foundation and Connor B. Judge Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO. With support from Genentech. Welcome back to Demystifying NMO. As usual, I'm your host, Chelsea Judge. This episode is a special one. It's going to be a review of the NMOSD diagnostic process with a unique perspective from a clinician and NMOSD patient, Dr. Joanna Robles. We will discuss the current standards or criteria for the NMOSD diagnosis, incorporating Dr. Robles' particular patient journey and clinical insights. Notably, neither Dr. Robles or myself, a PhD immunologist, are NMOSD clinicians, clinical neuroimmunologists with clinical experience in the diagnosis of NMOSD. This is an important distinction as we recommend that NMO MS patients be seen or consulted with a board certified neurologist with expertise and qualifications within neuroimmunology. That being said, we will discuss as clinician and patient with Dr. Robles. Um, an immunologist and patient advocate myself, the NMOSD diagnostic criteria was notable pearls of personal insight and experience. And with that, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Joanna Robles. She is a pediatric hematologist and oncologist who was diagnosed with NMOSD in 2020. She became involved with the Sumire Foundation for NMO soon after her diagnosis, when she sought support from other patients with NMO and found a family providing comfort and hope in the midst of a life-altering diagnosis. Her personal journey leading to her diagnosis of NMO and learning about the journeys of other patients in this community led to a recognition of the gaps in knowledge among clinicians regarding the warning signs of NMO and the devastating consequences when optimal medical care is delayed. By joining the Sumire Foundation, Dr. Robles hopes to bring awareness to the world of NMO as both a patient and a physician. Who better to be here to have a conversation on the NMO diagnostic criteria? Dr. Robles, thank you so much for being with us today. I think that you're really going to provide excellent insight and experience as a clinician yourself and an NMOSD patient. I thought it was really ironic that I was an immunologist and my brother got NMO, but you have an even deeper irony. So thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for inviting me. I'm super excited and happy um, to be here and to uh, discuss NMO and the diagnosis of NMO and my experiences. And so you were diagnosed with NMO just last year. So as if the pandemic wasn't enough. That's right. Yes, I was just diagnosed um, last September to October 2020 uh, after a pretty crazy experience over the summer where I was just having a ton of nausea. I couldn't really figure out what was causing it and then ultimately lost my left vision and was diagnosed with optic neuritis. I'm so sorry. And that I know how traumatic that process and confusing can be, even with someone who, you know, has the high level of uh, clinical education that you do. So who, who helped make that diagnosis for you? Were you seeing a neurologist, a neuroimmunologist, an ophthalmologist? At first I was seeing a primary care doctor and then a gastroenterologist because Mm -hmm. all I had were symptoms of persistent nausea and vomiting. So at that time, didn't really think that this had anything to do with anything neurologic. Um, Ironically, my husband is a neurologist um, and I did uh, ask him a few times (laughs) to just make sure he didn't see anything (laughs) concerning on my neurologic exam, (laughs) which he did not at the time. And so um, I was undergoing a workup through initially primary care. And then um, when the symptoms persisted, he sent me to gastroenterology who had set me up to get an endoscopy and um, some abdominal imaging. At that point, I had been set up for all that, but during the course of that, had started to have the left vision loss. Mm. So I got set up to see a neurologist who ordered um, a brain MRI. And then my brain MRI was actually read as normal. I eventually uh, ended up seeing an optometrist because that was the soonest um, appointment I could get in. When she noticed my vision loss, she um, immediately referred me to neuro-ophthalmology, 
But before that was done, um, thankfully, we were able to realize that the MRI actually did show left optic nerve enhancement, um, and I was referred to the emergency department. Wow. Yeah. And I think that that story, although intense, is probably um, not too uncommon for the NMO community. And I think you highlight or your story highlights just the multidisciplinary nature of NMOSD. So you saw a primary care doctor, a gastroenterologist for your symptoms, an optometrist. I could also like the where people who are typically just healthy see for like lenses versus an ophthalmologist, your neurologist husband, your other neurologist, just wow, so many doctors to get to one diagnosis. Definitely. I realized just how prolonged this process can Mm -hmm. be and that how scary it is to not know what's going on. And I was very thankful that I was able to be seen and diagnosed within a relatively quick period now that I've talked to other NMO patients Mm -hmm. that took a very long time to get their diagnosis. I thought it would be a good point here to highlight that because we know that it's so important to get a swift, appropriate, accurate diagnosis for NMO because of the very sudden and devastating relapses or attacks um, that can lead to permanent uh, neurological damage if not appropriately treated. Um, And so, you know, this is why we're here. So that we give more awareness to the importance of a good, appropriate, accurate diagnosis to get the appropriate treatment. It really seems like as long as people, as long as clinicians are aware of the diagnostic criteria for NMOSD, that it can be diagnosed by, you know, really a team effort. So an ophthalmologist uh, or neurologist, neuroimmunologist. But I thought it might be a little bit helpful to kind of explain where all these different specialists or, or ists are. What does it mean? And as a clinician yourself, if you could just walk through a little bit of the process, like what does it take to be a clinician, to be a doctor in general? Definitely. I can talk a little bit about my experience and the training that I received and then talk about how neurology relates to that in ophthalmology and other specialties. I attended four years of undergraduate university and received a Bachelor of Biomedical Sciences. Um, So most doctors will have gone to undergrad and have received some four-year degree, doesn't necessarily need to be related to biology but meet the qualifications that uh, medical school requires, um, which often requires several science classes as well as advanced mathematical classes as well to get the prerequisites for medical school. Then medical school um, at most places would be four years. There are some physicians that decide to do an MD, PhD, and so that might be a longer process while they're getting both their medical degree and a PhD. And then afterwards, you do a residency of your choice, uh, depending on what specialty you want to enter. So for example, I did a three-year residency in general pediatrics. And then after that, I decided I wanted to specialize in pediatric hematology oncology, and I did another three years of training for fellowship training to get to that point to be a pediatric hematologist oncologist. So a neurologist, on the other hand, would have um, done the uh, typically four years of undergrad and then four years of medical school at least. And again, these paths can vary if they had previous careers or if they had obtained other types of degrees along the way, taking a break or anything like that. And then after medical school, a neurologist typically does a four-year residency where one of those years is typically mostly focused on internal medicine and those three years afterwards are focused on neurology. And I did have some insight into that process because my husband did have to complete a neurology residency. Wow, I still can't get over that irony. (laughs) Um, And so then, depending on if a neurologist wants to subspecialize, there are several neurology fellowships as well. So for example, my husband did an epilepsy fellowship and that can be uh, one to two years depending on the program. I think it's now standard to do a two year program. And many physicians that treat NMO 
have also done a neuroimmunology fellowship, which is one to two years mm -hmm. afterwards, specifically focused on um, multiple sclerosis, NMO, and other neuroimmunologic disorders. Uh, but not all physicians that treat NMO have gone through that path. I think that's a really good point, and is that you might have neurologists who are treating MS, NMO, who have extensive experience in treating these um, neuroimmune disorders, but have not undergone a particular neuroimmunology or MS uh, fellowship. But to my knowledge, it's also because those fellowships are relatively new within the clinical sphere. And so it seems like there's a bit of Hmm. Like a, a field shift where you are seeing more and more rising neuroimmunologists who have that particular specialty or fellowship training at the same time where you have these designated neurologists who didn't go through that but have extensive experience. That's right. A big reason for that is that there previously were not all of these fellowships. So people became familiar with the specific disease of interest that they wanted to treat by just going and seeing a bunch of those patients, which is in essentially what fellowship does is you're focusing on a specific disease population um, to get that expertise. So it has just now become more standardized mm -hmm. to do fellowship, but I think once upon a time, it was kind of, it was something that people would have gained experience in, but not necessarily have had to formally go through a fellowship. That makes sense. And so now we're starting to see, I think, like a more of a rise of those neuroimmunologists. And um, I've even seen, right, designated NMO clinics, like what Dr. Levy is doing out in Boston. And I think that that is really great and helpful to have someone just totally in focused, laser focused on NMO or one particular disease or specialty. But at the same time, M NMO MS patients can also get great, adequate treatment and care at other centers with other neurologists. That's right. And I will say that, you know, just from my standpoint, for example, as a pediatric hematologist oncologist, there may be uh, diseases that I come across that I haven't had a ton of experience uh, in. Pediatric cancer is relatively rare. And so it is important that I, as a clinician, whenever there's something that I haven't had a ton of experience with, I know the literature, I've mm -hmm. looked in. I've realized how to treat it, but that I also reach out to other experts that maybe that is their niche, that is their expertise, and they would be able to give me some insight. So I do that quite, you know, quite a bit in my field where there are sometimes situations that we just haven't run into before. And I think it's important to know your limitations and know when to ask for help as a clinician. I love hearing that from you as a clinician, um, the importance of knowing your limits and also just the power of collaboration with other experts and people who might have had more experience or different experiences, especially with something like NMO, where as we get into the diagnostic criteria, a lot of it is um, a diagnosis of exclusion. And so you have to be able to tweeze out infections and other neurological or potentially vascular conditions. So I think that's really helpful to keep in mind. That's right. Well, we're going to jump into the consensus diagnos diagnostic criteria for NMOSD. So this is a neurology. So this is a journal, this like top tier journal within the neurology field from 2015 published by Dr. Wingerchuk of the Mayo Clinic. He's the first author. There's a ton of other authors for people who are um, going to check this out. And if they're not already aware, and I'll make sure to link this paper in our notes. And the title is International Consensus Diagnostic Criteria for Neuromyelitis Optica Spectrum Disorders. As we review it, we're not going to try to keep this very academic, right? This is for our greater NMOSD community who are already very well informed. I love that about this community. Um, but to just review this from a high level and weave it in with your personal experiences as an NMOSD patient yourself. It sounds good. So one of the, the chief things that I think um, are really important to note, obviously, are just the clinical characteristics and the fact and emphasizing that NMO. SD, as the name implies, NMO spectrum disorder, it is a spectrum. Um, and so patients, not all patients look alike. One patient will look totally different. There are a number of clinical characteristics for NMOSD, and these clinical characteristics 
in the assessment, so when your neuro neurologist or any clinician is assessing you for these, is going to be really pivotal in determining if you have NMOSD or not, especially if you are, you know, in combining that with the available biomarkers, the AQP4 antibody and the MOG antibody. So I, I was wondering if you could speak to us a bit about the clinical characteristics that are known for NMOSD and your personal experiences. I know you've already shared um, some of the GI issues that you had to face. Yeah, definitely. So um, the GI issues that I faced were the result of the, what is called the area of Prostrema syndrome. And so those are episodes of otherwise unexplained hiccups or nausea and vomiting. So later I came to realize that the cause of all my nausea and vomiting was because of this area of Prostrema syndrome, which is one of the core clinical characteristics of NMOSD. Another core char clinical characteristic is the optic neuritis. So that's basically what caused my left vision loss due to inflammation of my left optic nerve. And so that is another common clinical characteristic for NMOSD. Along with acute transverse myelitis, which can cause acute paralysis, um, paresthesias, uh, bowel or bladder incontinence. And really those symptoms vary based on how advanced the myelitis is at the time of diagnosis and intervention. Thank you. And I know that if a patient test positive for AQP4, it's my understanding based off of this paper that to receive an NMOSD um, diagnosis, again, if positive for AQP4, so that's NMO seropositive, meaning you have this autoantibody to the aquaporin 4 on your blood work or via um, spinal tap, so in the cerebral spinal fluid, that that is paired with at least one clinical characteristic that you just described. So either the myelitis, optic neuritis, area postrema syndrome, um, specific MRI lesions or cerebral syndrome, that gets you the NMOSD diagnosis. However, there are, there are about, what, up to 20% of NMOSD patients who are not positive for the AQP4 antibody, and we call them NMO seronegative. And they, to my understanding, need to have at least two of those clinical characteristics to include optic neuritis, the acute myelitis with that longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, or that area postrema syn syndrome that you yourself suffered from um, to show dissemination or space that uh, basically the, the inflammation that's causing these pathologies is not localized in one specific part of the CNS. Does that make sense? Is that accurate? Yes, that's my understanding. And I think what made my diagnosis pretty straightforward was that I did test positive for the AQP4 antibody. Mm. And so that in combination with my optic neuritis alone was what met the diagnostic criteria for NMOSD. Interestingly, they did mention before that came back that it would be a bit trickier to convincingly make the diagnosis to, if that had been negative. Yeah, and I think that's what a lot of people are in um, a gray area. So while most patients, right, will test positive for it, there, you know, are a significant amount who do not. And then I think you have to go through, I mean, always to confirm and get an accurate diagnosis, but there's extra emphasis then on exclusion of alternative diagnoses as well as fulfillment of additional MRI requirements. So making sure that the imaging or the, the window into the pathology of NMOSD is, is met or is clear. And I think that hopefully the field is getting better, more specialized, we have a greater understanding of those seronegatives. Um, and maybe there's other autoantibodies, right? Like we were seeing with the rise of appreciation for MOG positive patients, that myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein antibody. So we are learning so much and I hope, obviously the goal with these diagnostic criteria and the research is to make even swift, uh, better, uh, accurate diagnoses to, you know, immediately get patients on treatment to better help their outcome. And so for you, after you had your diagnosis, I mean, that's like a whirlwind. How did you just feel as a human going through this? It was all just very overwhelming. Um, I had been going through a transition with my work and then 
we had been going through this pandemic and the start of all that and just recognizing it wasn't going to just be a couple months and this wasn't going away. And, um, and so we just had a lot of changes going on during that time and it was a huge adjustment to make and, and recognize and cope with that, you know, this was something that was chronic. It wasn't something that was just going to be quickly resolved and go away and that I was going to need to require treatment for the rest of my life mm. and that there were certain things in the future, like if, when I want to have children in the future and things like that, that I never really had to put much thought into before. So it was, it was quite a bit of an adjustment, but I'm very thankful that I had support through the, um, a ladies I met through the Samira Foundation and that had my husband and that I had great family support as well as an excellent um, neuro neurologist that I was able to connect with. Yeah, I think that that is really pivotal is making sure that you have a really full social support system, including friends, family, uh, patients like you, people who know intimately what you're going through and then obviously a good relationship um, with your clinical care team. Just no words. I know how um, traumatic, life-changing, obviously, an NMOSD diag diagnosis is for the for you as a person, the patient, and, and the whole family, the whole team um, th is really impacted by it as well. And kind of shifting gears just a little bit again is like highlighting like that it shouldn't be this way, that you shouldn't be, quote, lucky to get a fast diagnosis, right? Like, of course, no one wants to have these rare neuroimmune disorders like NMOSD, like MS, but that it's just so important to quickly identify what they are so that they can be appropriately treated. And I know that used to be, and still is to some extent, um, an NMO was misdiagnosed as MS, and that was obviously not good because the treatments for relapses in NMO are different than uh, treatment strategies for multiple sclerosis, where some of those treatments for MS can actually not help or even worsen NMOSD. So just highlighting, again, the importance for a swift and accurate diagnosis, which is really based on understanding the current standards um, or diagnostic criteria. Definitely. And if there is someone seeing a neurologist who admits that neuroimmunology is not quite their expertise or comfort area that uh, that they potentially seek out um, to see someone who is more comfortable with neuroimmunologic disorders. And then if you're comfortable sharing, once you got your NMO diagnosis, what did your acute relapse management look like? And then how how swift or how quick did you and your uh, neurologist, treating neurologist, begin to put together um, a maintenance therapy plan? When I was diagnosed with the optic neuritis, I was immediately hospitalized for um, IV steroids. I received three doses of IV steroids, was transitioned then to um, a course of oral steroids while waiting for my um, AQP4 antibody to come back. Once that came back, I was able to get seen by a neuroimmunologist and was able to uh, start a plan for what I would be starting for preventative therapy. And I stayed on the steroids until I started preventative therapy. It took about, so I would say I, I received my, I was hospitalized uh, the week of September 20th, and then I received my official diagnosis, say, by October 1st. By the end of October, I did start my preventative therapy, which was rituximab. So it took a little bit just for coordination because it needed insurance approval mm -hmm. and it needed the at day hospital availability and all of these other logistics um, to get it set up. but. Fortunately, it wasn't too long of a wait for that. Well, that's reassuring and good to hear. And given the fact that we are now in year two of a global pandemic, can you speak to receiving this kind of diagnosis that requires immunosuppressive treatment? Can you give any kind of patient and or clinical insight to what that is like? Yeah, I think it definitely adds um, another layer of stress to an already stressful situation. You try to 
avoid exposures as much as you can. Um, and when you're receiving ongoing immunosuppressive therapy, and specifically in my case and the case of many patients with NMOSD receiving antibody targeted treatments, you know, we don't know what our response to vaccines looks like and how effective it'll be for us. It's really stressful to think about as not having that same layer of protection. Mm -hmm. In my case, I often see patients with COVID, you know, I have to gown up and <laughs> go into the very rooms that we're trying to avoid. So that does add another layer of stress. Oh yeah, I can't imagine. So I'm going to have really two parts to this question because you have this unique perspective as both a clinician and an NMOSD patient. If you could go back in time to a little over a year ago now when you were receiving your NMOSD diagnosis, what would you tell yourself as a, as a patient? And then also as a clinician, do you have any pearls or insights for your fellow clinicians? That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I did, that's a big one. It's loaded. So please take your time. <laughs> so I'd say as a patient going back, I delayed seeking treatment. I kind of said, oh, maybe the nausea is because I'm wearing a mask all day. I thought maybe it's because I was preg like pregnant mm -hmm. and kept taking pregnancy tests. <laughs> and then I, I was like, maybe just keep eating something weird <laughs> and try to avoid eating certain foods. And I kind of put that off. Also, as a patient, um, well, both a clinician and a patient, it's easy to get caught up with just life and staying busy with work and putting off your own health care. So I actually had not even established primary care despite living in this area for three years. I had not established with the primary care physician. So when I recognized that this was not something going away and I needed to get checked out, it took several weeks to even get a primary care appointment because takes a while to get established with a new primary care physician. And so I wish I had kind of prioritized my health first, had a really established kind of care with a primary care doctor. That way I wasn't meeting someone new and trying to get a visit with someone who didn't know me um, as I was having these acute symptoms. Mm. I think as a clinician, what I've learned is really the importance of listening to your patients, not following what somebody else previously said. I think a lot of times that there was a previous diagnosis that was put in the chart or previous impression, it's easy to run with that mm -hmm. and to get up with that. But I always try to go back and look at, okay, what, is this patient telling me what do their labs show? What do I think this is? With tr really trying not to always go on with biases that might have been brought up in previous visits and trying to look at patients with a new set of, you know, just a new perspective. Mm -hmm. No, I think that that's incredibly helpful. And I think it's like dotting the I's and crossing the T's to make sure, and also to give empathy and compassion to the person who's sitting in front of you and really listen and hear them out so you can give them the best accurate uh, diagnosis and care. I think that that's excellent. I just want to say again, thank you, thank you. And I am so in awe of your advocacy and work. And, you know, you do have this extra power effect being a clinician yourself. So thank you so much for all the work that you do for the NMO community. And thank you for all the work that you do with putting this together to educate our community. I hope you enjoyed our discussion and found it helpful in better understanding the diagnostic criteria for NMOSD and those who are certified to give a diagnosis for NMOSD. Please stay tuned for our next part, which is going to be after the NMO diagnosis, controlling what you can. 
We will have this out to you in just the next couple of weeks. We hope that you are having a wonderful holiday season with those closest to you, and we hope that you are still staying vigilant and careful as the COVID-19 pandemic rages. Always remember the basics of what you can do. Get vaccinated, get a boost, talk with your clinical care team, wear a mask indoors, avoid crowds, social distance. We've got this.